Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this week's uh, sabbatical live webinar. Uh, we're coming to you here from sunny Sydney and after an exciting few weeks, uh, we've got a, a really exciting topic to talk about and that's the new 45 foot Sea Wind 1370. Uh, so our, for those who are uh, uninitiated, our sabbatical live series is essentially a, a, a summit of speakers, experts from the marine industry, and uh, accomplished cruisers. And today we're uh, lucky to be joined with Shane Grover from uh, the Sea Wind Factory. Um, Shane is the sales manager for Sea Winds and have just had a record breaking uh, few weeks with the release of the new uh, Sea Wind 1370. Um, I worked with Shane for many years at, at Sea Winds in Australia uh, when I was there. And uh, back in those days, he was an apprentice shipwright. Uh, and has since come through in, um, in a management role for sales and marketing. So he's got a very broad understanding of both the construction and the building of the boats through to um, what's important for customers when it comes to design. So uh, we wanted to get deep into the new design and explore it a little bit from the aspect of, uh, of this being a, a, a true sea wind that's going to be really appealing, I think, for a lot of sea wind owners out there that we, uh, we talk to and have a lot to do with, and also those coming through. Um, so, uh, Shane, mate, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for joining us all the way from Vietnam. Yeah, thanks, Brent, and uh, hi, everyone. So it's been a busy few weeks, mate. Uh, what an exciting time. Uh, for it, yeah, it has been. Yeah, we uh, obviously we, we spent a lot of time doing market research on this boat, making sure that, that everything we were doing was going to... Uh, to, to to meet the requirements of a 35 foot cruiser. And uh, so we had expectations that we would have reasonable demand and, and obviously that gave us confidence to set up a third production line for this boat. Uh, but we were, we were blown out of the water <laughs> with our forecast. Yeah, we, uh, so we originally anticipated uh, six boats in the first year uh, and then 12 boats each year onwards. And we, we sold, uh, something like 18 boats in the first, the first 24 hours. Um, and then by the end of the first week, we we're at over 30 boats. Mm. That's extraordinary. Um, I mean, I think everyone at, at the Seawind team need to be congratulated. It's um, an outstanding uh, result for you guys, and particularly for you, mate. Uh, great, great to you know bring it all together and, and get a great product to market. Um, I think what's, uh, you know, I guess, having been involved with Seawinds and the owners for so long, Something in the mid 40s has always been longed for. Uh, you know, the 1160 owners, 1260 owners, big jump up to the 1600, obviously. So, this, this 45 footer, um, I think, has is, is really been looked forward to for many years. And, um, and it's great to see it's, it's come to fruition. And you can really tell Richard's uh, had a lot to do with the design because it's truly a sea wind uh, in, its, in its DNA and its concept. But obviously modernised in many ways, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We we, we noticed the same worldwide. Um, we, there, there has obviously for a while now been a big gap between the sixteen hundred and the twelve sixty, um, and, and features that people want from one boat or all the other on uh, on and vice versa. Uh, and so we've been able to to not only meet that that demand in the size, but also in the the features that people require on that boat by by learning from the feedback we've had from, from our owners and from, from prospective buyers on the 1260, 1160 and 1600. And we've really put all the best bits into this in this 45 foot package. Yeah. And I think what's also been interesting is obviously um, the, the sailing YouTube channel, Ruby Rose, uh, coming on board. I mean, they were obviously big fans of what Seawind had done through their, uh, their review uh, series of, of all sorts of cats at various boat shows. I think they did 20 tests or something and um, mm. and Sea Wind came out uh, sort of number one, both through their own um, reviews, but also through their large public boat, which is a really innovative uh, approach to, I guess, educating and, and diving into the boats. Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting time because obviously um, the traditional way where, you know, Companies with big marketing budgets would spend lots in magazines and get big boat reviews, you know, um, and have lots of advertising. And has always pushed towards, uh, you know, lots of luxury and lots of volume and, and space. 
And, the, you know, we've seen over the years the movement away from a good sailing platform towards that sort of design. Yeah, and, and, and yet, you know, these guys have come through from a different, I guess, you know, from a sailor's angle and, and looked at it for its merits as a sailing boat, which, um, which you know, I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, you know, we, we've sort of all been in, along that uh, philosophy for many years. So, um, you know, it must be uh, it, good to see that recognised after a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you're completely right. This is not the way that that the company would normally launch a new a new boat. Um, you know, typically, we would do it at a boat show. We would we, we, a physical presence. Um, it, while, while albeit we might not have a model um, ready for the show, we would normally announce around a show so we can talk to people about the show. We might have a model of the boat. Um, certainly, you know, some presentations to show, and uh, and obviously, as you point out, a lot of advertising. Uh, we haven't really done any advertising for this. This boat. Uh, all all of the uh, the exposure this boat's had has been through uh, through digital channels, and and uh, none of it paid. Mm. And but I think the importance of that is it's it's highlighted um, I guess technical aspects of of sea winds that may have not been um, I don't know as as not had the attention that it probably deserves for for a long time, and and uh, this has really cut through that a little bit to. You know, come back to the core roots of a of a good sailing platform. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's where a boat show uh, favours big, fat, slow catamarans over over ones that actually uh, perform a bit better. And that's because you're not sailing at a boat show. So unless you actually get out on the boat and make the time to uh, go for a sail, you can't really make those comparisons of how good that boat actually is as a, as a blue water cruiser. Um, this this going to, yeah with the uh, online channel and being able to talk through some of those benefits and characteristics, we've been able to, to make that uh, presentation uh, much more understandable to people, given that we're, uh, we're not just looking at uh, volume inside and bed space. Yeah. So it, it seems that uh, catamaran designs have somewhat matured in some respects in that, um, you know, we've gone full circle and coming back to emphasis on, you know, on, on good performance and sailing. So, you know, which is great. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it seems very straightforward to us, but um, you know it, it's so important to have a, a proper sailing boat that performs well. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit um, to, to, I guess, see the approach that you guys have taken. I'll, I'll bring up a slide here. Um, so there's some really interesting numbers here that we can look at with the, the 1370. Now, the one that screams out, first of all, is the displacement. Um, 11 tonnes, Shane, that's uh, compared to... Most 45 footers out on the market, that is quite a light boat. Um, how has that been achieved? So again, this is just through um, the, the DNA of, of the Seawin brand and, and the builds that we've, uh, and techniques we've put in place on our other models. Um, so the, the entire hull deck, you know, all, all components are infused or vacuum bags. So there's no heavy hand laid components. We don't do any, any hand laid composites for the factory. Um, there's no bolster in the build. You, the boats you're comparing to, a lot of them will be built using bolster. Um, so this is all using foam core, uh, PVC closed cell foam core. So again, not only does that make the boat lighter, uh, it also eliminates the possibility of, of uh, water tracking through the cells or uh, rot in, in the hull. Um, the hull is fully foam cored above and below water line. Um, but with with, with, with reinforced the hull using a combination of e-glass and carbon fiber and also uh, on the under the water line in the areas again because this boat has been designed as a true go anywhere do anything uh, anything boat so we're, we're coming from a, of the uh, perspective of if you're looking at the world of automobiles you'd be looking at something like a uh, a, a Land Rover Discovery or something that, you know the, think of the car that, that can go anywhere that's what we're trying to develop with this boat so the bow area um, will have a skin of Kevlar under the water line to protect from I impact from logs or, or debris in the water containers, for instance. Um, Kevlar doesn't add much stiffness or strength, but what it does do is if you have an impact, it will hold together. It won't fall apart, so you won't penetrate the hull. Right. Interesting stuff. Okay. And um, going through a couple, of the, a couple of these numbers, so really good wind deck clearance there at um, 850. Um, so, yep, so more wing deck clearance than, 
than any other model. Mm -hmm. And and obviously the uh, the little wave breaker is uh, is still there, but a little bit smaller in proportion. Yeah, so uh, it's actually much longer, uh, and we've 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 kept the uh, the same principle, but we've lengthened it, which actually adds stiffness longitudinally in the hull. Um, and then we are still storing our fuel, uh, sorry, our, our water in the uh, central area, but the water will be kept much lower and, and spread out over a longer surface. So the tanks will be removable if, uh, if there's a need to remove tanks down the line. Right. And I, I think it's important to keep coming back to this because this is very much a seaman and those who have um, been on a, an 1160 or a 1260, um, even the, the old 1000s, uh, you know, there's still that DNA that carries through. So that... You know, the storage of, of water tanks, uh, fuel tanks, I assume, are down above the keel yep. in, in the central axis, and uh, and also the, the batteries, which we'll come to a little bit later, but keeping all your weight centralised and down fairly low. And obviously, you're not having, you know, flybridge helms or anything. Uh, you've, you've kept away from that still? Yeah, absolutely. Again, this is this is a true sea wind. This is being built around the the same formula that made the uh, 1160 and 1260 very successful. Yeah, and keeping your boom low, keeping the center of effort low, um, yeah. obviously gives you a nice ride when uh, in choppy conditions. So there's, there's, there's actually been far more emphasis uh, on the uh, the ride comfort on this model. So again, through things like, like we just discussed with lowering the center of gravity and the center of, uh, of uh, the sail area, um, but also the hull shape has been designed to uh, reduce pitching and keep a very flat ride. So not only does that make the performance greater, uh, it has the added benefit of also making a more comfortable uh, ride underway. Yeah, right. So we'll, we'll, come, we'll have a look at uh, some of the hull design shortly. Um, a bit quickly here. So sail drives at four, uh, 40 horsepower, Yen, Yenmar uh, diesel sail drives, and there's an option to go to 45s, I think. There currently is an option to go to 45, and we are exploring the possibility to actually uh, increase that to 57. Right. Because I assume the 45 is just a turbo version of the of the 40. No, the 45 is actually the 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 lowest power in the same block size as the 57. Right. So for a very minimal weight penalty, uh, we believe. Well, we know we can go to the uh, the 57 now um, in the in the, the the size of the the engine bay. Um, so we're just working through with Yanmar on the on the possibility of that as the upper limit for the boat, um, which is all looking positive, and we'll we'll announce that shortly if that if that becomes possible. And what do you think about engine size? This is something I've had a few discussions with customers about picking the engine size. Do you have a, a um, personal? My, my yeah, my philosophy has changed on that over the years. I, given that our 1160 and 1260 uh, have always been powered as standard with the 29. With an upgrade to 40, I always felt the 29s were absolutely fine. Um, mm. Never, I've never really felt the desire to, to have more. However, on our 1600, we we have a big big uh, jump in in option uh, engine sizing from 57 as a standard to 80 as the option. And it is really nice to have that extra power. Not that the boat the boat can go faster, but not that you push it so much faster. But when you're cruising at uh, you know eight knots, you've just you've, you're knocking back. To uh, 70% of your rev range, mm. so the engines are just just they're, they're not uh, strained as much, they're not as noisy, and your fuel burn is actually quite lower. So I actually am, am tending to lean towards if uh, if, there's a, if there's a minimal weight penalty for the additional uh, engine size, it, it is worth having on board. Yeah, yeah, it's a um, the motor's working easy, I guess. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, quite a big main there, 80 square metres. Um, so I guess into a square top and, and pretty big jib there too, 36 square metres as a self-tagger. Yeah, so one thing that has changed uh, from our prior uh, philosophy with our rig and cell design is the mast has actually moved back uh, a slight percentage, which means that, uh, that proportionately, the mast is actually slightly taller, but the foot of the mainsail is a little bit shorter. Um, but what that does for us is it gives us a more powerful jib. So the jib now, because it is a, a self-tacker, we've always been forced to reduce the size of the jib, but because we've moved the mast back, we're now able to have a quite powerful jib. So we've got a, a more balanced sail set up. Right. So that's really interesting because we are, you know, we typically um, 
I don't know, not typically, we're seeing more and more Genoa's fitted to the other smaller designs uh, for the lighter, you know, lighter air performance and yep, uh, yep. off the breeze. So that larger jib would almost fill that gap of a Genoa on the smaller boats. The, the sail setup on this boat, I think, will be uh, a really well-balanced package. And even just the main and jib alone, I don't think most people will be found wanting uh, more sail area. Uh, unless you're looking at certain uh, wind angles where you, where you would go to the code zero, code zero or a switcher. Yeah, okay. So let's let's have a, a look at that. And, and as we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna come back to hull design and then back to sail uh, wardrobe. So the, the hull design is a departure from the earlier sea winds in that you've got a, I guess a chined hull, both on the inner and outer sides of the hull. Uh, yep. to give you, I guess, extra vo volume inside, but still a, a pretty narrow hull Yeah, shape. exactly. So we've, we've kept a very similar um, length to beam, but hull beam ratio. So even though the boat is, is bigger at 45 feet, the hull has become proportionately longer, uh, sorry, wider, but it hasn't then become additionally wider to pick up extra volume. So we've still got a very slender hull. That's, that's the end result. But yeah, slender, slender we did, yeah, exactly. But we did have, as one of our requirements, we had certain areas that we needed to uh, improve on over the, the what the scaled up tall 60 would be. And one of the large areas that we had to focus on was the aft cabin, which we wanted to make sure we could turn that aft cabin into a real uh, third cabin with a double bed that, that a couple could spend quite a bit of time on. Um, and we've been able to achieve that by adding a try. And now this is technology we've taken from the, the uh, Seawind 1600. We have the same concept on that boat. We have again learnt from that boat, and we've, we've, we've slightly uh, we've slightly improved the hull shape from there again. But we have used that that same concept to pick up uh, what amounts to around uh, it's slightly over 200 mil. So we're we're uh, you're talking when you when you add that to the double bed, uh, an extra 200 mil is is a is a reasonable amount, um, and it certainly makes it go from livable to comfortable. Yeah. So let's bring up. Um... We'll just come to that rear cabin real quick. Um, if we can bring that up, bring it with me. Right, long slide. I just want to show that uh, particular cabin that you're talking about while we're on the subject before we move back into sale wardrobe, which I think is really important. Um, Of technology. All right, so here we are. So if we can see um, the aft cabin here, so yeah, it is. So that's like a that's a queen bed there we've got in the stern. Uh, I think it doesn't quite qualify as a queen, but it's definitely right. a double. It, it, okay. It's Big not deal. a uh, it's not a boat double. It's a it's a proper double. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the way you've achieved that, of course, is that you know the waterline is probably somewhere down here. But the chine yeah, is exactly. allowing the extra width and the, the exactly cabin. yeah both inboard and outboard yeah okay yeah. okay and that's gotcha. also enabled us to have these midship uh, midship heads uh, on the starboard side um, and still have the walkway space inboard okay all right so let's um, let's take a step back to where we were um, I just want to uh, dive back into the hull shape and. Um, particularly sale wardrobe, because these are conversations I'm having right now with customers making yep. their decisions and uh, and we want to, I guess, help help them steer them on the right path here. Uh, obviously, it's plenty of time to to work out uh, what's going to happen there. And, and actually, just on that point, Shane, I mean, you know, with 30-something orders on the books, um, I mean, we've, we've got production really getting out there a fair way in advance, but there are plans to step up production capacity, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. The only reason that we are, we are so so late with our production availability at this stage is just because we didn't forecast this, this many uh, orders so quickly. Um, we're now reviewing our, uh, our scheduling again uh, based on the order books that we have. Um, and we're looking into all options, uh, both in, in bringing in the right people to, to scale up, uh, looking for additional space, um, and also you know, really streamlining our, uh, our production line. With this many boats in order, we can really get things uh, streamlined and, and, and 
I'm very confident we'll, uh, we'll be able to increase the uh, output of this model, which means that all the, all the boats will come forward in their dates. We won't, in, we won't have any uh, you know, new slots opening up earlier on that people can j jump in, but all the people who have committed to this boat will progressively get their boats earlier. Um, so if you do want a boat earlier than the current date, you'll need to be on the order books uh, at some stage and those, those dates will all move up. Yeah, so the message is get on the queue, when uh, when things uh, you know crank up, you'll be the first off of the uh, the earlier exactly. timing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And to put that into context, I guess I think the production times that's been put to uh, the public and the dealers, I think it's based on like twelve boats a year. Is that right? It was actually based on six boats in the first twelve months, then twelve boats a year onwards, and we'll be looking to to substantially more than that. Um, Obviously, until we've got a solid plan and, 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 and if we can show to ourselves that we've got progress towards that goal, we won't go and publish those dates. Um, we're not going to publish dates that we're not confident we can commit to. Um, but once we are, we will uh, we'll provide those updates. Yeah. But even during my time when we are down at uh, Wollongong in, in Australia building boats, we were doing twice that on the 1260 lines, I think 20. Exactly. And that's, we, we know how to do it. We've done it before. And uh, it's now just a case of implementing it here with this model. The only reason that we hadn't planned it previously is because we just didn't expect to have the, uh, the demand for this uh, at that scale. Yeah, okay. Good to hear. Uh, we, we want to get some more boats out there on the water. So <laughs> uh, we, we don't have nearly enough coming to Australia. But anyway, that's, we'll work on that. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the sail wardrobe, so we talked about the jib, so big self-tacking jib. Uh, big square top mainsail. Now the uh, the options out here with the bowsprit and the uh, the longer on. Mm -hmm. right, right, okay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that firstly allows a screecher to be attached from that standard Correct. fitting, Correct. and an asymmetrical yep. kite from the optional bowsprit. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So this is something we've taken pretty much straight from the 1600. It's a feature that uh, that I, I, I really love. Um, on that boat, and we get a lot of positive feedback on from that boat. Um, what that does, it turns the, the what, would, what we would traditionally call the catwalk into a structural member of the boat. So that provides both support to the forestay and forebeam, uh, but it also provides support for the, the anchor launch, uh, the bowsprit, and the screecher. All this means that we don't need to have water stays for, the, for any of those forward flying downwind sails. So traditionally, we would have a, a bowsprit on a somewhat a gooseneck, basically something that, that has a articulation, and the water stays that go down to pad eyes on the bows would hold the bowsprit down. Um, the issue with that is it's just a little bit more complication. It's, it's you know it's lines that that cause interference in the water. It's lines that you've got to have your bridle go either either inside or outside of when you when you when you're uh, anchoring. Um, when you retract the bowsprit, you've got to keep those lines clear from, from scraping on the, you know, any of the aluminium or the gel coat. And so it's a little bit more um, cumbersome than just have self-supported poles. Yep. Um, so we really, we really like that feature on the 1500 and it was, it was definitely something on our list to incorporate on this model. There's a, a number of other features as well. We've really gone through all of our boats, um, plus uh, through the feedback of, of sailing up Ruby Rose, uh, a lot of the features that they like on other boats and, and, and you know, how we're getting good comments and feedback from, on their, from their patrons. And we've really looked at the whole market and we've taken all the best bits. But most of those bits have come from our own, our own range, yeah. like this long run. So yeah. basically the anchoring system will work very much the same as the 1260. So the anchor is mounted uh, right up against the forebeam. It's mounted within this long run. The chain actually runs internally through the long run back to the windlass. And there's a dedicated, because the anchor is mounted on the center line, there's a dedicated channel mounted in the, in the top of the longer on, which runs back to the uh, first uh, locker on deck, which means you can run your bridle through the launch for the longer on. The bridle will sit in that channel, and then you clip it to a dedicated hook inside the first locker, and the bridle's away. It, you don't need to think about you know, pulling up one side tighter than the other. It'll keep the bridle out of the way. And so we're really thinking through all the processes of, uh, of, of this boat or how you use the boat and making sure everything has, uh, has been thought through before the boat's been built rather than just giving you a bridle and having you figure out what to do with it when you pull it up. 
Yeah, no, it's a really clean, smart design. And anyone who's, uh, like you said, laid a bridle with a bowsprit in place with all the stays and everything that goes with it knows that it's a, it can be a pain. So that just cleans it right up. Um, and I've seen that system that you've got where you attach the bridle inside the longer, longer on, and it's a very clean, neat system, and obviously well thought through. Um, with that being a structural uh, element, do we expect to see the option for a stay sale off that, or, or not necessarily? Um, I don't expect so. Uh, I think we would favour the, um, the the zip on type um, storm sale over the four stay as opposed to a stay sale. Um, one of the reasons being is it does, it, with a self-packing jib, it does make it a little bit harder to, uh, to fly a stay sail. You, obviously, you can't just have it set up in advance and still use the, the, the existing jib. So you've, you've already got a stage where you've got to make a change um, uh, going from the, the jib to the stay sail. So I think we've, given that we've got a self-packing jib, we would prefer a, a zip-on style stay sail, a storm sail. Okay. Now, a... A point that um, we don't see on the older sea winds um, is the, I guess, the, the, all the lines hidden under the deck. Um, so where are they hidden? Are they going down the sides still? I assume so to get to the, to the helm position. Yeah, they actually they follow basically the same path they would follow on uh, on a 1260. So they come from the mast, they move outboard, and then progressively curve around the deck. Um, do you have a deck view there at all, Brent? I do. Um, let's go to come back to these slides. There we go. Yeah. Okay. You can't see it on this this uh, render here, but basically that forty five uh, window panel. There you go. Just um, outboard and forward of that, there is a, um, a, a basically a hatch on the deck with a uh, a little trough in it, and that has the deck organizer. Sorry, just outboard, Brent. Uh, up a bit more. Yeah, around there. There's a hatch mounted there. That will have the deck organisers to turn the turn the line. Okay. <clears throat> and it will also have our deck fills for, for water and um, and fuel. Right. It'll all be covered under this little hatch. Um, okay. Yeah, so the lines will actually run through conduits underneath the deck to that little locker. And then it'll turn. So you've got access to the turning block. So you, it's easy to feed lines and, and check, check your lines and make, do maintenance. And then they'll turn off and they'll run back to the Germans. Now, what we've also done is improved on the 1260 concept with this, uh, this uh, deck hardware arrangement by the helm there. We've mounted the jammers and the exits for those lines uh, on top of that rise that raised area. So when you mount your side clears, you'll be able to access the jammers and winches internally. So you won't have to go outside of the clears to open up the jammers to, to, to change sails or... Uh, or, or really right, go sailing. So think, yeah, we can see that line there. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's that little, that's that raised area where the side clears would clip onto. Excellent. That's fantastic. Um, so let's let's just jump back there a little bit and um, I'll just bring up the helm position. We'll come back to some of these slides in a minute. Um, because I think, you know, again, and, and I'd actually, before we go any further, just mentioned if you have questions for Shane along the way, uh, feel free to ask him. If we can answer them along the way, we will. Otherwise, we'll come back to him towards the end. But please, uh, please ask your questions uh, while we do this. So um, the helm position is very much a sea wind helm, isn't it? This is a, a like very similar to a sea wind 1260 or an 1160 for that matter. Yeah. So uh, now these windows obviously they remove uh, is that a retractable that's, a, that's electric an electric window? yeah the sliding window yep as per the 1260 all right so the windows yep. go down and then you're looking through these big toughened glass very large panoramic yep. windows and i think the helms on the sea winds are one of the most underrated helms in the industry that's such a, a all-round um, position there to keep out of the weather you've got this huge shade position you can still see everything and you've got all the controls at your fingertips, plus a twin helm that's not heavily exposed. So, um, so as you were saying, you've got all the rope clutches here, big rope bag dedicated for it, uh, very sea wind approach to that. This will be either a ice box uh, or option for fridge freezer under the helm. Great. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. So close, uh, close for the helmsman to get a, a cold one if they need be. I see. Uh, 
some cup holders. holders. Right? <laughs> it's amazing yep. the advances in uh, yep. design technology that's come. I think we've been Probably up to 35 years of feedback yeah. wanting for, uh, for cup holders. So it's fantastic to see that yeah. advancement. Um, and then obviously, you know, all your, your normal panels. Uh, is this is this the chart plotter down here on the... That's a chart plotter. Um, full disclosure, that helm is, is, is from the styling point, um, what we'll be looking to achieve. We're still working on the you know, optimizing the placement of the of the equipment and you know making those angles uh, ideal. You can see yeah. there that angle is not quite uh, correctly angled at the at the skipper. Um, but yes, the, the chart plotter is standard. We've mounted out there, and that will take up to a 12 inch chart plotter. Right. If if somebody wants a larger chart plotter, um, like a 16 inch, which we have seen recently on on a few boats, we would be able to mount that uh, internally the same way we do the the 1260, which would be on a swinging pivot. Good arm. The reason we've gone for this, which is very much what we do on the 1600, uh, on a boat of this size where you've got a dedicated nav table, uh, forward facing, looking through the forward windows, typically you would have two chart plotters. You would have one at the helm and you would have one at the nav station. Sure. And um, we've obviously got uh, option for electronic, tiptronic controls here. So you can yep. use both uh, controls at either helm, which is really neat if you're coming alongside you know, marina's not you're not used to all the time. It's an advantage of the uh, the twin helm, and we've got this uh, really wide hard top, similar to the twelve sixty, I guess, because you've got the yep. step right at the edge of the, the cockpit, um, which is great. So, and that's where you'd expect to put covers and clears down against and be able to enclose that whole space in. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, whether it be clears to for an enclosure or. Um, shades that would run out to the lifelines for, for shade when the sun is angled low. Um, we can do both, yeah. There yeah, this is, a, this is a photo recently posted um, from Chris of No Regrets. Uh, thank you, Chris, of, um, of some clears and covers that he's recently put on. So it'd be a very similar arrangement to that if you want to completely close it, no doubt. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah excellent. Um, why don't we step inside the boat? And uh, I guess I wanted to highlight particularly some owners out there, the, the headroom through this boat is phenomenal. Yeah, so it, it is part of our design brief for this boat. <clears throat> we have had, uh, over the last uh, two or three years, we've had enough people who haven't been able to buy a 1600 or a 1260 because of head height that we decided with this boat, you know what? We're going we're gonna to make these people happy. <laughs> we, we, yeah. So uh, I think Brent pointed out when we originally presented this uh, that he's finally going to be able to do a boat tour without having duck. <laughs> <laughs> That's wrong. So uh, we, we, we do have, uh, I think it's an average of two metres and five centimetres head height throughout the boat. But you'll see that's, that's basically on the lower end. Uh, in some cases, we're, well, we're uh, in, in the cockpit there with 2.2 2 metres, uh, 138. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking, uh, I think that's about six foot nine, I think we're talking six foot eight, six foot nine throughout the boat. Um, which is, which is, it's just, it's fantastic. Um, that's, that's going to make the boat really livable for, for people regardless of height. Yeah. I mean, I, I often walk around like this cause I've got a permanent <laughs> prick in my neck from, uh, from boat tours, but, um, no, it's, it's great to see the extra headroom through there. And particularly, I think people will notice it down inside the cabins. And we've got some headrooms here through the uh, the main companionways and cabin spaces. So, again, that's over two metres of, of headroom yeah. through the cabins. So, I guess... we actually, you notice with this, this cutaway section here, we've, we've obviously been able to pick that up because the deck is much flatter. It still has some camber, as you can see, but in comparison to a 1260, we keep that, that constant head height throughout. What we also keep is a single level floor the whole way through the hull. So there's actually, there's no step ups or step downs. Yeah. And uh, with the likes of the main bulkhead, for instance, there's actually no, no lip uh, at that doorway. The, the floor will be completely flat. So with the doors open, you've got a flat floor from uh, bow to stern, which is the same as we have on our 1600. And it's a really nice, really nice feature. It, it makes the boat uh, feel much more open. It removes trip hazards. Um, it's, a, it's a nice addition to this design. Excellent. Now, um, while we're on this image, I just want to look there at the uh, the 
the motor position here. Now, obviously, the sail drive's just drawn on it incorrectly because it's going to be yeah. the, the, the actual drive. It'll be the other way around, facing, yeah. Facing rear, but yeah. the the position of it is in this location, um, so the motor's facing in reverse. That's uh, right. But that's to allow servicing from an external hatch now. Yes, correct. So there's a hatch uh, basically directly above that on the, on the deck. Um, so you can access, uh, step down on top of the engine as you do with the 1600, and then you can step into the engine bay. So you've actually, you've got a, a decent sized engine bay in there. Uh, but we've also retained the, uh, the inside access to the engine. Uh, and that'll be either through the, the back of the, the port head or underneath the starboard aft bunk. Excellent. So yeah, if you need to gain access internally for both motors, you can still do that. Correct, yeah. Well, that, the, the main reason we've gone to this is because of a boat of this size and an engine of this size. Uh, if you had to do a, an engine replacement or you know, a severe uh, engine job at any stage, removing it through the boat is just not feasible. So we did need that, uh, that external access to be able to install or remove the engine. And therefore, um, we've had to add that. But we also wanted to keep that feature from our 1160-1260 line where you can do maintenance and access the engine internally where, when the conditions fail. Yeah, if you've got really ugly conditions outside, you don't want to be pooped. Yeah. Uh, but equally, the hatch actually opens facing, I mean, it's like facing yeah. rear. Right. So in theory, that will keep out a bit of wash if you're going, you know, in, in pretty ugly weather to change a, a belt or something. Um, yeah. So again, coming back to headroom, I guess for any uh, uh, anyone that's been on the on the sea winds, you know, they've got this... Uh, this style of island bed, and the reason for that is sitting still up on the on the bridge deck there, um, the wing deck is to obviously give it uh, the best performance through the hull by not making that hull super fat still. Yes, yes, exactly. So obviously, if you imagine if we didn't have this wing deck bed up here, this cabin would be nothing more than a child's berth or, or a very you know, single V berth uh, in the front. Um, and therefore you'd be, you'd be needing to use your aft cabin uh, as your primary cabin. The downside to that is you don't get as good airflow through an aft cabin as you do through a forward cabin like this. You look at these two overhead hatches over here, they will really scoop up the air and then funnel it through this hull. So you get much better airflow with a forward, forward head, uh, sorry, forward cabin. And uh, by, by moving the, the, uh, the, the bed over the wing deck, which is otherwise somewhat dead space and just, just you know, deck storage or on a lot of boats, it would just be a trampoline up there. Um, we're able to really make this huge, nice uh, apartment size uh, room, really. Yeah, yeah, and it's because that extra head rod, like it's just huge, the uh, the volume in those cabins now. Um, yeah. It's it's looking a bit more like a gunboat than, uh, than a seawind, which, is, which yeah. is pretty cool. Um, the, uh, this this walk-in robe, I mean, that. No one's barely even mentioned that. I mean, it's, that's going to be a huge amount of storage for, for someone living on the boat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, um, that's, a, that's a really nice area. That's, uh, you've obviously got the ability to, to close it off uh, as well, so you can keep all your junk in there and keep it out of sight. But uh, you've got hanging rails in there. You've got a, a, a seat uh, for changing and obviously storage below that. Um, the, and really, the, what, you, what you do in that area is just pretty endless. Um, that's, a, that's a very... Uh, an open area that you can do a, a lot with. You could put shelving in there and, and you know, store boxes and equipment or, uh, or, or keep it as a nice, uh, clean, uh, hanging, uh, hanging uh, clothing. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, so we've, we've had a look at um, some of the uh, plans already of the boat and it's all fairly self-explanatory, I suppose. Um, where do you anticipate the freezer being located on the boat? So the freezer, the top loading freezer at the moment is uh, positioned just outboard of the nav station. Right. So uh, you don't see it on this, this, this drawing here where, where there's a little uh, cutaway and there's some books, I think, stored in that, uh, on top of that shelf. Yeah. Below there will actually be a slide out top loading freezer. So you would walk to the forward side of the, the galley um, and then slide out that freezer from the, from the wall and it would cover over the, the top steps. So you, you're protected from falling down the steps with, with that open. Um, and you can reach in, pull out whatever you want, and then slide that back away. Yeah, excellent. And um, and back here in the cockpit, I assume this is where the barbecue is going to be located, and quite a large yeah. uh, space for a barbecue there. 
that's right. So that, the barbecue will be stored there. Um, that's just covered by the, you know, it's covered by a cover at the moment, which is a you know a teak or timber cover. Um, but there would also be the possibility to to turn that cover into a uh, a, a cutting board for, for you know, fish cleaning. Yeah, excellent. And um, if we go to the other layout, this is the four cabin layout. So essentially, they're just relocating the. The, the bathroom to the midships section, but it still looks like a generous amount of, of room there for a separate head and shower. It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for a charter operator, that's probably quite a good layout without ending up with a million heads and showers and whatnot. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, this this layout <clears throat> is really quite a practical layout. You've got two decent sized heads. Um, you've got all the cabins you need for, for chartering. Uh, obviously we can do the, the four cabin, four head version, but you are then, doing what most charter cats do, which is having heads that are quite tiny uh, to achieve that. Yeah. So this is, this is definitely for a charter boat, I, I would prefer this option, uh, the four cabin, two heads. Yeah. Now in terms of, um, and if we go back to the other slide there, in terms of locating things such as uh, generators, uh, water makers and, and the sort, well, firstly, where would a generator be stored? Is that back into the big sail locker? <clears throat> That's right just underneath the, uh, the, the mast there. We've actually, from the 1260, we've slightly rearranged those forward deck lockers to make the, the, the aft locker below the mast a little bit smaller and the locker just forward of that um, much larger, which means that the locker directly under the mast is quite uh, well suited for the size of a generator. So that would become a dirty locker. That would be where you would have your generator, you could have you know, fuel stores, um, you know, things like that could all be in there. So you're not getting, you're not storing fuel with sails and, and, and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. So then the locker just forward of that then is much larger to be able to throw your sails in or maybe a fold up bike and things like that into, yeah. Oh, that's so actually I think idea. this, this, this uh, that bulkhead position there isn't quite right on this, uh, this GA. Uh, we might have to adjust that, but yeah, it'll be, the, the probably switch those two around, the, the right. larger one slightly forward and the smaller one just aft. Yeah. Excellent. And water makers? Where would a water maker be located? Water maker would be in the um, port engine bay. Port engine bay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, let's have a chat about um, electrics, I guess. Now, one of the, I guess, advantages um, is that the technology in regards to solar panels has come a long way, as has yep. um, uh, lithium batteries. And this has obviously been designed with a massive um shade roof here but doubles the space for solar panels so exactly uh what what sort of solar panel capacity can the boat take and and and, and, and is that really designed to be aligned with the lithium or how how are you sort of recommending people package that yeah so that that roof has been designed as you say uh with solar in mind so we've we can currently fit with, with the current technology of solar panels, we can fit uh, 1,900 watts of solar on that roof while still having reasonable access to the boom and, and around you know, access onto the roof and, and around the roof, um, which is a, that's, a, that's a huge amount of solar. But you think the mm. typical, uh, really the typical high option 1260 these days would be going out with about 800 watts of solar. So we're more than double. Um, and, and that's more solar than we do on the, the, the 1600 currently as well. So it's a huge amount of solar, um, obviously paired with, I think with that amount of solar, we're looking at, uh, I think it might be, it's at least two regulators. It might be three regulators to, to handle that, that input. Um, and then, yes, I, 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 what we're definitely seeing is a trend towards lithium and, and for the better, uh, 100% for the better. We were skeptical going to lithium uh, very early on a few years back because obviously there has been, there, there are some horror stories out there and we, We've got seawind owners who have changed over to lithium and had issues in that process. And so we, we and in talking to those owners, we learned through that the feedback of where they had issues. And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that if we were going to do uh, lithium, we need to partner with a uh, with a company who can provide that system, you know, the, the system design, the full package, so that we we get a working system that's reliable, has the service we need and uh, it's going to do the job. We didn't want to be buying batteries from company A, buying regulators from company B, and then yep. everybody points at each other and says, it's their fault, and which is what we still, still happens. And, uh, and so we, we've, uh, we've always been using, for the last 
10 years or so, we've been using Master Vault for uh, all our, uh, our controllers and, and really in the same company, Master Vault Power, it's owned by Power Products LLC, who also owns BEP, which does the DC switching, the AC switching. So basically all of our electronics, cables, switching, you know, um, and controllers are all from this same company. So they really take complete charge of this, this entire system, whether it be lithium or AGM. Um, so we work with with uh, Master Vault. We're using the Master Vault batteries, and and really we've been doing this flawlessly uh, since our first installation. Uh, and we've the the reason the package works well uh, is because we're using where we're maximising the the uh, output we can get from all of our onboard equipment, and we're maximising the amount of that charge we can take in, which you cannot do with AGM. So. Firstly, obviously, we've got a huge amount of uh, a huge solar array. So we're getting a huge amount of power from solar while the, when the sun's out. We're also upgrading the or adding extra alternators to the engine. So we're adding 200 amp alternators from Master Vault. And so all that power uh, that we're generating in an AGM battery would would surpass what the battery can actually take. So the battery on an AGM can, can typically take around 60 amps uh, charge. Whereas the lithiums, I think we're, at, we're over 600 for a lithium battery. So basically all the power that we're getting from this equipment, those batteries can take very quickly. So uh, what that means is, uh, you know, if you run your engines for an hour or two hours a day, you can basically provide all the power you need for, you know, for overnight uh, use. For, and that's for not just for the typical items uh like the dc items which would be covered by the solar but you can also do things like running running your air conditioning uh running electric hob um you really can get a much more usable electric package because this these uh, lithium batteries are able to take that charge so much faster yeah so that's the big difference isn't it you can essentially get away with not having a generator and still yep. be able to run ac um maybe not day and night forever but uh, no with the addition of turning the motors on for a little while to bump the, the solar. Exactly. I mean, you just, you're just thinking that your motors essentially are now becoming a generator. And um, while I probably wouldn't recommend that you just leave the boat at anchor and run your motors you know, all day, every day to, to power your equipment, if you're, a, if you're a cruiser and you're moving around, as you're moving around, you run your motor every now and then to, to provide uh, assistance, you're also generating power for your battery bank. And obviously, if you're in a marina, which is really where you typically need air conditioning, you can plug in the mains power. It's your plug-in. Got yeah. another source there anyway. Exactly. Uh, but it's removing an extra motor, removing weight. The lithium batteries are obviously quite light. You can very light. Yep. Use almost 100% of the battery capacity using 100% of of the alternator output, which is much much bigger with this package, isn't it? It's 200 yep. amp. Um, yeah. Alternators, and that's on top of the standard alternators that come with the Yenma, or is that in place of? It's on top of the standard mo standard alternators. The standard alternators, unfortunately, they're not um, they're not really adding to your house bank. The standard alternators are are just charging your start battery, so they'll actually only run for the first you know fifteen minutes or so to provide power to the to the start battery. And the reason, the main reason that we're we we're triggered to to do this addition with the alternators is the internal regulators in a standard alternator. Uh, they're not compatible with lithium batteries. So that, that, we did find that in our initial testing uh, process a few years back, that you have to, you have to use a better alternator uh, than, a, than the standard alternator if you're using lithium batteries. So yeah. it's, it's one of these things, you can't just go and throw lithium at the boat with the same system. The system is it's a completely different way of wiring the boat and, uh, and managing the, the electronics. So uh, that, that, that lithium battery package that we provide is that full solution? It's it's everything. It's it's the uh, it's the alternators. It's the way that the boat's wired and the charging systems, the monitoring systems. You know, there's even uh, safety shutoffs on the battery, so that if the if the if the power is drawn down below, I think it gets to 20 percent. There's actually a, a fail safe that just shuts off the battery, so it can't draw down any further, and you protect the battery. Uh, so they're really it's a it's a really well thought through uh, and foolproof system. Excellent. Um, and that doesn't just go for the uh, air conditioning, but you can essentially fully electrify the boat in terms of cooking. You could have mm -hmm. uh, induction stove tops, electric yep. oven, or I think you're using a convection uh, microwave yep. uh, oven system. 
Yep. Um, so, and I assume if you wanted to, you could you could go to an electric barbecue as well if you wanted to get rid of gas completely. Or Look, there's no reason that you can't. I still I still recommend people consider balancing that system. Ultimately, the more power you draw, the more power you have to put back in. Exactly. Uh, so I would my my preference is for um, electric barbecue. Sorry, gas barbecue, gas stove top. Uh, an electric microwave oven. I think that is a really nice balance. Um, it gives you the nice, the, the household standard uh, oven you know, and microwave combination. So you can cook a you know, roast on, on board, but you do that less frequently than you would, you know, boil up some, some water or, or uh, cook spaghetti on the stovetop. So you've still got the, the gas for the, the day-to-day cooking. Um, and also you've got a balance. If, if one system, if you're, if you're low on power because you've had a couple of days of, uh, a uh, you know, couple of cloudy days and you haven't been motoring, um, then you can still cook without having to worry about it. So it, it just balances that out and, and re- reduces the amount of management you have to do to your uh, your power consumption. Well, and let's be honest, I think the barbecue gets used more than anything else on, on a ceiling, right. so, yeah. at least in Australia. Like, come on. Um, yeah. So you're going you're gonna to have plenty of capacity there. Uh, and, you know, electric barbecue, still not convinced. Yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> the same. <laughs> I think it's, a, yeah. it's a long draw, a long bow to draw, but uh, it's going to be the same. But anyway, good to know, good to know what the options are there. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're, we're closing in on the hour, so I'm just going to go to some Q and A, uh, Shane here now, if you like. Um, yep. Help us with that. So uh, one question comes through here. Um, I don't think we necessarily have an answer for this off off the bat, but uh, Ian's asked: Is it um, if it's a stay sail uh, or storm sail? What sort of storm sail area would be carried? I'm not sure you know that off the top of your head, but no, I, I don't have a have an answer for that at this stage. Um, over the years, we haven't actually done that many storm sails, so either that would be something that you would uh, get your local loft. To work with you on we can also work on it for you but we'll probably do that uh, upon request um, rather than uh, having it uh, up front if enough people ask for it then we would we would work it out we would make it a standard option yeah excellent uh, we've also had another question here uh, in the future will it be an option for dagger boards uh, versus mini keels um, I, so- I do have the answer for that and and the answer is, is no no it, this, this this boat has been designed uh, to a to a brief, uh, and the brief really is to be a go anywhere, do anything, um, you know, tough boat to go around the world for, for liverboards, and kind of 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 any skill set. So you don't need to be a gun sailor to be able to buy a thirteen seventy and 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 go off around the world. Um, and dagger boards, while they do give you the additional performance, you, you have to understand it comes at the Trade off of they are more vulnerable than mini keels. You can bounce off a reef on with a boat on mini keels. You can't do that with a boat with dagger force. Mm. And uh, so we've basically our range for our sport models includes our 1190 sport and our 1600. They're our two performance cruisers, and the 1370 is it's firmly a uh, you know it's a well performing cruiser as a, as opposed to what we would call a performance cruiser. Not that it won't perform with, you know, some of our naval architects are convinced that it's going to be performing very closely to our 1600. Uh, and, it's in, and, and through that's through the hull design that we've actually picked up performance rather than just going stagger boards. And I think um, Ruby Rose actually pointed out in one of their videos uh, they recently did talking with our, our naval architects here at, at Seawind was you can't, if you just put uh, dagger boards on something like a lagoon, it's not going to be a performance boat. It might mm. perform a bit better than what it does. There's a whole range of things that, that create performance. And so we've focused on all, all, you know, all the things that don't add complications for use to, to gain our performance. And we've kept the simplicity of the, of the skeg rudders and mini keels. Yeah. In terms of uh, just further on this question, I'm guessing there's a performance package available. So that would essentially be a, a sail wardrobe package more than anything. So there are some things, and this is something that we've learnt from uh, the 1600, and this has definitely influenced uh, our, our design of this boat. Again, the 1600 was designed as a performance cruiser. But what we found was most of the owners were actually loading their boats up um, as a liverboard cruiser, you know, with things like washing machines and dishwashers and all this sort of stuff. And, and we didn't have enough options to counter that additional weight. So we had things like carbon fiber masks and synthetic rigging, um, but people were very quickly putting more options on than, than even that to cover. 
So we have thought about this more in this in, in the 1370. Obviously, we've catered to that in our design parameters. So we've actually designed the boat to be optimal at a higher loaded displacement. So when you do put all these options on and, and you know washing machines and things on, and the weight increases, which it naturally will, it is actually getting closer to its designed waterline rather than going away from its design waterline. So obviously, it'll still perform better. Uh, lighter than its design waterline, which is the base as the base boat is. All boats are faster the lighter they get, but it doesn't mean you won't be getting adverse performance when you load it up. Um, yeah, sorry, I've gone off. I've, <laughs> I've gone off. That's all right, that's all question. Right. So we got another question here from Peter. Yeah. Um, are the keels sacrificial? So maybe you can take us. Yeah, through sure. The, I, look, I would. I would call them they're not sacrificial as in as in they'll fall off the boat if you bump them. They are laminated into the the hull mold. Uh, but what we've done is what, what we what we've done with 1260 1160 is we actually glass in a shelf uh, which is about um, it's, it's papered to, to the bottom, but it's probably at its lowest point about uh, 300 mil deep, um, which becomes the the sump where the bilges are mount, the bilge pumps are mounted. And that becomes a, 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 a cutoff point, a safety point. So if you do, you, you, you ground the boat on rocks, you, you, know, you, you smash it as hard as you can, it's not going to tear off above that point. It'll, it'll, you, know, you can do impact damage below that, but you've got a safety point um, where that sump is. Yeah, okay. So, um, so essentially got a, a, you know, a, a collision area there with the keel. Um, and the keel obviously protects the sail drive and yep. it's typically slightly deeper than the rudder. And you can sit the boat on those keels, I imagine, still? Yeah, yep, yep. the boat's still supported by the keels. Yeah. And then right up in the forward, you've got a, a collision bulkhead, no doubt, in the, in the forward. Uh, the collision bulkhead is actually horizontal. All right, okay, down here. Yep. Yeah, so similar to our 1600, which means that we can use the space above that as a wet locker. Yes. Um, and there is also a bulkhead uh, at, the, at the aft edge of that locker. So whether it's essentially you've got two collision bulkheads, you've got the first one, which is a horizontal, plus you've got the, the vertical behind it. Um, so you've got, uh, there's a few protections before you get into the hull. Yeah, so if you hit a, a log or something at the water and, and it you know damages the hull, it's it's not gonna have water ingress into the, into the boat Correct. and you can repair it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so what else we got here coming through? Um, talk about life raft location, Shane. Yeah, so um, the life raft location is, is in the rear beam. Quite a few catamarans do this, this currently. Uh, and we went through a few different options of looking for the optimum life raft location. We ended up coming down to that as the, uh, as the best solution. Um, so it's very, very, it's very similar to our 1600, but that launches uh, downwards. This one will launch aft, out of the aft beam. Um, but it's, uh, it's sort of tucked away. It's out of sight, out of mind, but very easy to, to launch and deploy when you need to in a hurry. So basically, uh, if you just move the mouse yeah, down a little bit, Brent, just outboard of that divot, yeah, it's in that area there. In this, in this sort of back yeah. section of the, yeah. the transom. Right, so it'll be a cavity there that it, you can slide into and rest, is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be out of the way and only only there when you need it. Okay. And um, all right. G'day, Edward. Welcome, mate. Um, good to have you on board. Uh, so let's get to some more questions here. Uh, Jeremy uh, has asked, where is the gas locker for storage of the gas bottles? And is there a provision for two nine kilo bottles? Tell us about the gas. Um, the gas is, the gas bottles are located in the locker below the barbecue. Um, right, so over here. Chance in there. Yep. Um, there will be provision for two bottles. I am unsure what size those bottles would be at this stage. Yeah. Typically, they're twin four and a half bottles. Which typically, they're four and a half. Most, uh, most boats are very happy with, unless you're a, I don't know, a really busy day charter boat cranking through lots of gas. Um, which we are, but uh, uh, yeah, okay. And and really, you're only supplying gas for your for your barbecue and, and maybe your your stove top. Typically, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they do tend to last quite a while. Um, okay. 
uh, uh, Alex, Alex uh, has joined us. He's um, asked about uh, the breakfast bar, which I don't have a picture of here straight up. Uh, is that an option or uh, or uh, what's what's the situation with the breakfast bar? Is that just a standard? No, that, that, that's standard. Um, so it, it's basically just, a, it'll be hinged extension on the on the uh, galley countertop. <clears throat> so uh, in the standard position, it would be folded down. Um, and if you want to access it, you just, you'd just lift it up and it would clip into place. And there are some uh, seats or stools there that would be, um, uh, we, yep, there you go. So they're, they're, those, those stool, that design's not, not final, but basically there'd be some stools that fold up um, and have a dedicated location to store, but are also able to, to pull out and use there. And we're, 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 we're playing with different concepts there, but it'll be something that we, we provide. Yeah, so that'll slide out of the way somewhere, will it? The, it, it hinges basically. So in the down position, you would see that uh, along the, the uh, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And of course, it's got the boat's got the big trifold door system, similar to uh, the other sea winds that drops down and, and closes. Yeah, exactly. Off. So, so you mentioned uh, just earlier you're talking about the helm. So if anybody uh, hasn't seen a sea wind uh, helm before, you actually go onto our website and go to this uh, viewer. You can actually click on the dot just in front of the helm there, Brent, in the bottom left. You can actually click on that, uh, and then you'll actually see what you would see from the helm position. Because this boat, uh, the, the hard top has been designed slightly differently, we've actually got very small mullions, the, the supports that hold the roof up in, uh, in the front windows. So you've got far more, uh, much more glass uh, and less, uh, less uh, composite structure. So you've got a very clear 360 uh, degree views. Yeah, the windows are fantastic on this boat. Um, quite big, and obviously the the two windows at the front are going to be forward opening windows. Is that yeah? Uh, they can, they're completely opening. That's right. Yeah, yeah, such a great feature on the sea winds because obviously the natural ventilation, um, you know, is, is such a nice feature of the sea winds, and, and keeping that's uh, a fantastic item. So um, excellent. Um, okay, so Edward. Uh, question around going full solar without gas. Yes, we've talked about that, an option, but prefer a little bit of gas. Um, Mike has joined us, lockers under, uh, are there lockers under in the cockpit sole? That's a good question. So in the floor here, are we gonna have any lockers like the 1600 or just a, just a normal? No, no, just a flat floor. It'll, it'll be like the, uh, uh, like the 1260, there's not much space in between the, uh, the two soles and the, and the wind deck there. Yeah, and the reason that is on the 1600, obviously, is the cockpit has stepped cockpit up, rate. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's right. And back here, what about, I can see a little uh, little line here. Is that is that some storage underneath? Yeah, that's, that's a locker seats? in there, yep. And obviously, this uh, this is a little roving ottoman. Um, that's a remote, yep, yep. And will that be an ice box of some kind, will it? Or? No, that'll be quite a lightweight uh, box uh, that can be moved from inside. It's the same box as the one inside. So that'll be something that can be used inside or outside. Right, right. And I notice actually, uh, come back to this image here. The there's a there's a large or reasonable size hatch for a a, a window here. Um, yeah, this uh, this 360 view is actually missing a, a step there, which is a sliding yeah. step that slices yeah. through the through the middle of that window. Yeah. So yeah, the window, that window essentially provides you you know, uh, light down into the, yeah. either your cabin or into the, into the yeah. head. Yeah. So that'll still be a full piece window as it is, but there'll just be a, a floating step that's uh, going through the middle of that. Yeah. A uh, question from Ian, where to store a dive compressor? Good question. I'd like to know that answer. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> um, what we, where we install on the Sol 60, which is I think where we're leaning to on this boat, which would be under one of the helms. Um, yep. It so most likely a, would be under this helm because we're, we're tending to favour the port helm for, for bridge. Uh, yeah. So yes, most likely under this under this helm. Um, but that's not def completely defined yet. We're also uh, open to looking into having the compressor installed in one of the bow lockers and running fixed hosing um, back to tanks somewhere in the cockpit. Two options yeah. that we're exploring here. At this stage, I would say the most likely uh, solution will be under that helm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, there, there's a, I think there's a good video. In fact, you guys did of a custom um, dive 
Was it a dive compressor that's compartment right. on the on yep. the 1260 underneath the helm? Uh, yeah, that's the right. Port side on that on that particular boat, but that was a really yep. neat setup. So um, we want to. Uh, I think that's a, a great solution. Um, uh, what else we got here? Um, standard sales. Uh, is Dacron, I take it, Dacron? Main yeah, and standard jib? sales are Dacron main and jib. Um, you then can upgrade to uh, cruising laminate main and jib, which I think was what most people will, will end up with on their boats. Uh, the next upgrade, which we call a racing laminate sail, um, and maybe that may not be the best description for it because nowadays um, the, the sail that we'll be using for that, or the laminate we'll be using for that, is the... Um, GPL light skin, which I believe bring a few boats in your marina are using that, that cloth. Yes. And that's like a dark, dark gray, black cloth um, from Dimension Polyant. And it's got very good, it's, it's, it's both a very well, uh, it's a very uh, strong sail, which uh, has low stretch, so which makes it great for performance. It also has great durability uh, and anti-mildew properties. So it actually makes a very good all-rounder sail as well. So we call that the, the racing laminate uh, upgrade. Um, but in reality, that's just a you know, high performance, high durability sail. And I think that uh, that will actually become a, uh, that, that would be my pre preferable sail choice for this boat. I think it would really complement the boat. Um, in addition to that, then you've got a, a screecher, which is, uh, I use the term screecher very loosely. It's actually a very uh, flat cut sail. So it's, a, it's an upwind, light air sail so it's for under 17 knots apparent um and it's when you know when when you are wanting more power um and the jib's not providing it and that would be fixed to the end of the longer run um on a uh, continuous line furler um and would we would sheet back to just back to just in front of the helm basically uh inboard of the of the uh of the, the, the side deck so it would, you know, right against the side of the yeah win, uh, the, win, the windows um so that would become a uh, yeah, very uh, light wind uh, uh, um, sail for, for, for sailing in sort of general conditions. Um, probably not quite as high as the jib, but, but, but not far off. Um, and then you've got your, your spinnaker, which flies off the end of the bow sprit. Uh, if you want to run it to a, a bow, like we do on the Sol 60 now, we'll have pad eyes on either bow, which you can run a tweaker to, to pull, pull it across to one side. But by mounting on the bow it also gives you the ability to fly that off a uh, top-down furler and have that uh, permanently set up. Excellent. Uh, we've had a question come in from Jeremy um, asking whether the the windows on the angles here, the 45-degree angle windows, will they be opening as well or just the two forward ones? No, just the two forward ones that will be opening. The, uh, the, the 45s will be fixed. Yeah, and it may not have been clear on the other images, but this shows it quite well. They are really big windows too, aren't they? They are, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you're going to have a huge amount of airflow through those. So uh, you probably don't need much else there. Um, we've got a question here from David. Uh, where are you, David? Yeah, welcome, David. Um, are there any lifelines across the front beam? Good question. Uh, as standard, there will not be lifelines across the front beam. What the, there'll be a Dyneema top line, which will be attached to the, uh, the A-frame of the, uh, on the forebeam. And then run back and clipped onto the to the um, uh, to the pulpit. Um, that can then be unclipped and moved lower when you're flying the the future or code zero. Obviously, the issue is with uh, when full lifelines are along there, your 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 downwind sails will be rubbing on those lines. Um, but we will have an option for which has primarily been designed for Australian charter boats, but that option can be used for anybody. Uh, a essentially a survey compliant. Um, lifeline package, which will actually be uh, slightly higher. It'll include a fourth lifeline and it will also run across the four beam. Right. You just right. need to be conscious with that setup. Um, the, the flying a screecher becomes a little bit more uh, complicated. You might need to have a different cut screecher or the <clears> drum <throat> would need to be raised by about you know two foot or so. Yeah, maybe a strop on the bottom of the drum yeah. to get the foot up, yeah. Uh, so just on that point, um, we've probably got a few uh, charter people watching today. Uh, to get the boat in 1E survey passenger numbers, what's, what's your gut feeling on that? Mm -hmm. uh, gut feeling is it'll probably be similar numbers to the 1160, which is uh, 28. So I think we'll be 
in the range of 28 to 35. Um, I don't see it being much more than, than 35. Yeah, 35 people is, is a lot of people. Anyway, lot. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so that's, that's uh, probably sufficient. Um, See, you'll, you'll also notice, Brent, um, just for the for, you know, for people uh, chartering, because obviously we've had this feedback quite a bit, uh, especially in Sydney. Um, so we've got the side boarding gate there, uh, midships. Yes. Yep. You can see there. Um, and then we've also got on the transom, there's a cutaway with a step extends uh, about 150 mils. So it's enough to get your foot on. Um, no, I'm not sure if you've got it there, but the actual, the, the lower step on the transom, there's a a, it actually extends from the from the side of the deck slightly, so there is a foot stop that you can get onto when you're side side boarding. Also, because this uh, this more modern hull shape, the boat has less of a canoe profile uh, when looked from above, so it's much uh, it's much flatter. So you compare this to the 1260, the transom on the 1260 is much narrower, which means that when you do come side to the dock, the transom isn't as far away from the dock as it is on a 1260, proportionately. Um, so you've got less of a a gap to step over and then you've also got this little footstep that you can get your first step onto yeah so yeah that's worth pointing out there so you've got you know space just just big enough to get a good foothold on there and then up up the back steps uh when you're alongside um and then i guess under here you know these hatches you'll have space for uh for a swim ladder that's folded away out of yeah out of harm's way correct uh, yeah. and what do we got over here um just a, on, a on, for... on the other side? Yeah. Yeah. So your, your screen's uh, you're, you're not on your full screen view anymore, Brent. You're on your, your, your other, other one. But um, uh, the other side, actually, that, that's something we've been working through at the moment. We were looking to mount a, uh, a, a secondary anchor in there that, that could be deployed as a stern anchor. Unfortunately, just yesterday, uh, we discovered that uh, just even the smallest possible anchor uh, for the boat wouldn't fit. So we'll probably eliminate that hatch on one side um, as it's not really going to be very useful. Mm, mm, okay. Maybe a hydro generator um, location could be yep. worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else we got here? So we're just going to take a few more questions because I've had so many people ask me questions and I think it's a great opportunity to go straight to uh, the factory with some of these. Um, so uh, Alex again has asked, Ruby Rose mentioned some soft padding on the transom for protection. Is that standard? And what, what does that actually mean? Yeah, it is. Um, we've been doing that on the last couple of 1600s we built. Um, and, and we do notice that certainly when the, with the boats that, that launch here at the factory in Vietnam, um, and you know, in the first week, people are coming, you know, going, coming to and fro from the boat from the dinghy and it's so easy to do damage the transom with the dinghy. You, know, you come up, bow, bow two, and a little a little hook on the bow just smashes into the, the transom. And you know, two days in, and you've got a you've got a chip in your transom. Um, likewise, if you're if you're leaving a bit of a an awkward dock, you tend to uh, spring the the transom into the dock, um, and without any protection, then you, you're quite exposed to do some damage to the transom there. So uh, there will be a um, a rubber bumper, a white, a white uh, uh, bumper, which I think it's something like 50 mil um, high. So it's a reasonable size. It'll run around the inboard side uh, and the transom and slightly around the outboard side of the uh, transom. So you've really got a full transom protection. So you, if, it, if it comes down to the, the, the rear quarter hitting dock, you've got a bit of a rubber bumper there. If it's a dinghy hitting the transom, either inboard or outboard or, or aft, um, you've also got protection there against the, the dinghy. Uh, Brent, your microphone's off. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. I just had a delivery man drop something by. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, John has asked, G'day, John, uh, what is the maximum dinghy size for the boat? Um, it looks like it's about 3.8. Yeah, so typical rigid inflatable. Um, do you see capacity for something a bit bigger like a center console or are we just going to weigh the boat down too much? Um, it could carry it. I would favor against it. I think um, what we're looking uh, at, at doing is, I think the ideal size for this boat would be a 3.6. And, uh, and we're offering the, the high field three, uh, 360, either without the center console or with a, 
uh, so a typical uh, tiller, tiller steer uh, outboard, or with a side mount uh, lightweight sensor module, which has a seat and a side uh, arm which you can mount a wheel to. And that only adds, uh, it, it's something like 20 kilos. So it's not adding a huge amount of weight, but it does give you the ability to have uh, um, you know, a center console effect. Excellent. Okay, so I've got a few more questions here that have been fed through to me. Yeah. Um, again, I just want to take this opportunity just because it's been a, a crazy um, few weeks and, and, and the feedback's still getting out there. So uh, we've got here a question from Mark. Uh, and this is getting back to AC. This is an easy one. Is, is air conditioning available as reverse cycle? So typically, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a separate uh, diesel heater that also heats the hot water system if you run that system. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John has asked here, can you still view the mast and sails from your helm station? Um, yep. So if we go back to... Yeah, there's, there's a window above the helm. There you go. Yeah, so if we dive into this one here, shows it a little bit better. So, yeah, straight through that viewing window, you can see your rig and see the side, see your mainsail going up and uh, and see your, your jib. And obviously, I assume you can still pop out the side here if you wanted to. And, and yeah, exactly. You can still sit up on the side and, and sail from the side deck, uh, just like you can on the Shell 60. Yeah. Actually, if anybody um, has Google Cardboard or, or any uh, any sort of um, VR goggles, uh, this, this 360 view, you can uh, view this on your phone and select um, uh, the, the, the VR view and, uh, and actually have a look at it in kind of real proportions. I think most of these these, uh, these views have been taken at eye height. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, I've got another question here from Mark. Is there a way to use the jib and code zero goose wing downwind with a mainsail? No reason that you couldn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you could run a big symmetrical kite, could you? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, and just on that point, we're talking about this uh, earlier off air. Um, the bring up the slide again of the deck. Uh, you are planning to run an asymmetric kite from that bow sprit. If you did want to run a symmetrical kite and go dead downwind, do you see you know blocks being able to be run off the off the deck? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. That that would be possible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, We've had a few people asking around price. Uh, we do have pricing information available from us. If you wanted to um, uh, send in an email, we can send you a full price list and, and give you some recommendations on options. And uh, the price lists are in US dollars and ex-factory. So we can help with uh, shipping to Australia or delivery ex-factory and give you some advice around uh, costs. As far as import duties, well, there's actually no import duties to Australia, uh, but GST and so on. Uh, so get in touch and we can send that, that info through. Um, are we anticipating any price rises anytime soon, Shane, or uh, it hold steady for a while? Or what, what do you think there? Um, no, I, th I think we'll be holding steady for a while, but uh, if, if we continue at the rate we're going, we probably will we'll need to, to, to adjust the pricing. Um, but I think for now we'll we'll we're pretty steady. Yeah, and uh, so again, if if you get on the list, you lock in pricing and you're uh, you're safe as far I mean, as yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you if you put down a deposit on uh, on a thirteen seventy, you're you you're, you're protected from any price increases. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, listen, I think we'll leave it there unless there's any other last questions um, or anything I've, I've missed here. I don't think so. I think we've covered most of it. Um, thanks a lot for your time. Um, uh, Shane, I really appreciate it and giving some, some direct feedback to our customers uh, who are some of which have bought boats already. Uh, I see they're online today. So welcome, guys, and, and uh, some of which you should be buying boats shortly. Uh, so hopefully we'll, um, we'll help you there. And... Um, we really look forward to seeing uh, the first boats on the water, Shane. A really exciting time for Seaman. And, and again, congratulations to the whole team. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. We'll pass that on. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, nice talking to you today, Rent. No worries. All Talk right. Soon. Okay. Bye.